Alrighty, Cherub, so today we're going to talk uh, Old Kingdom Egypt. There's a little bit of a setup before we get into the actual pieces, so bear with me. This is going to be uh, lengthy. We may split this into two. Okay, but before we get started, make sure you go down and take that quiz on these two pieces from last time, and we'll go from there. Okay. So Egyptian art, you got to know, it runs a long, long time. Okay, we've got at least 3,000 years of history, and they are very, just very old. And the reason why they're old is because they have been isolated geographically for a big chunk of their history. So they were able to just do what they were doing and keep doing it. Um, they're going to be able to uh, develop an elaborate funerary system that's based off of what they observe in the natural world. Okay, so they're going to see the sun rising and setting and the, the Nile flooding um, at regular intervals. And that's going to influence how they see the world and life and death and the cycles of, of human existence. And so they're going to use that as a springboard then to create an, uh, a really complex uh, religious life. All right? Um, something else you need to know is that, like the Mesopotamians, the ancient Egyptians are going to depict people in a very standard way um, that is going to be um, the most easy to recognize of a human. So your torso is going to be full front, the legs are going to be in profile, the head is in profile, but the eye is the front, but it's on the side of the head. Okay. Ideas, longevity, okay? Egyptian history lasts for a long, long time and remains the same for a long, long time. Knowing the geography, knowing the Nile, knowing its surroundings, and knowing how the natural world interplays with their life and how it informs their life is important. Knowing that stability, they're going to value stability and consistency, Okay, they love the idea of cyclical time. Their their history is broken into dynasties or ruling families. Okay, and so there are thirty um, dynasties, and they've they've been split up into these different chunks of time. Okay, so there's roughly thirty different uh, families that have ruled uh, all of Egyptian history. And lastly, you need to know the role of the pharaoh, what the king does, and how, how he plays into all of this. Okay? So the theme for Egypt is the quest for immortality. So you're going to want to write this in your notebook uh, at the front in the timeline um, at the far right. Okay? So the quest for immortality is our theme. Here is some vocab. And here's some more vocab. I'm not going to sit here and go through these with you. You can read them. One of the things that you need to know is that the Egyptian soul has multiple parts that um, you need to preserve part of your body, which will help maintain your soul in the next life. That these different pieces of your soul need to be uh, maintained. Um, in some fashion so that you can inherit the next life, okay? So that your soul is immortal and to be able to live forever, you need these different parts intact. So you need the body. Your body is the, the case, the container for the different parts of your soul. Without a body, you can't live forever, okay? So you have to have a, a physical form to, for all the pieces of your soul to inhabit, your heart is going to be your emotional center. So the brain for the ancient Egyptians was not super important, but the heart was. And this is where we get the idea of, of the heart, the physical muscle of the heart being um, kind of the center of... We, th we think of it in the same way. We, we know that it pumps blood, and that's what it does, that we don't really have uh, feelings that, that generate from, from the heart but we still believe that, 
okay? And that comes back to ancient Egypt. The name, knowing someone's name was very, very important, okay? And it gave you power over them. So a name was part of the soul, okay? Because it, it's an aspect of you. There's the Ka, which is the spirit double or the life force. There's the Ba, which is bird-shaped, and it's your personality. So it'll, it's shaped like a bird, but it has your head, and it's your personality. When you mix the Ka and the Ba, you get the Ak, okay? The intelligence, or the transfigured soul. Okay. So you have all these different parts, and there are more. These are the big ones. All right. Now you also have a plethora of gods in ancient Egypt. The ancient Egyptians were polytheistic. So they they have a, well, a pantheon of different gods. Some of the key players we've got here in the center, we've got Ra. He's the sun god. Okay? So you can see he's got the sun disk sitting atop of his head. Okay? He has a falcon's head. And this is Ra. And he rides the boat, which is the sun, uh, every day. And then at night he goes through the Duat, the underworld, and he has to pass through these different gates and pass by these different monsters. And then he's reborn every, every day, and the cycle continues. We have Osiris, one-time king of Egypt, now lord of the dead. We have his wife and sister Isis. We have their brother, Set, and his wife and sister, Nephthys. So these four, Osiris, Isis, Set, and Nephthys, are all siblings. These two are married. These two are married. He was the god of agriculture. She is the goddess of magic. He's the god of the desert and chaos. And she is the god of the night. They have a son, and his name is Anubis, and he is a jackal head. Okay? He's the god of embalming. Osiris and Isis have a son, and his name is Horus, and Horus is the um, becomes the king of Egypt after Osiris. Alrighty. Now, Egyptian beliefs were not founded in good and evil per se, but rather they were, they looked at order versus chaos. Okay, so you have the feather of Maat, and this is Maat in personified, she's order. Okay, and she's symbolized by this feather. It's the feather of truth, the feather of order that um, helps maintain, you know, the, the balance of everything is civilization is held together by her, okay? And there are certain things that people have to do, that the king has to do, that keep her happy, all right? So there's order, civilization, all the good stuff, versus chaos, death, the desert, um, disorder, okay? So this is Set, again. So Set is sometimes the god of chaos, as is this guy, the serpent, Apep or Apophis, who's also uh, the chaotic element. Okay, so you got the snake, you got Set, these are chaos versus Mott, who is order. Okay. You get Osiris here, who is god of the dead. All right. And I'll link a video down below that kind of explains his history and his story. But you can tell that he's green, all right, which lets us see a couple things. Okay, so he is green, which means that he is um, dead, okay? He's a undead, which is why he's green. Um, he's on his head, he's wearing the crown, and on the sides, he's wearing... On the sides of the crown, right here, let me grab the laser, right here, those are feathers, feathers of Mott, okay? Now, he's dressed all in white because he is a mummy, 
Osiris was murdered by his brother Seth, and his wife Isis brings him back to life. He's holding the symbols of pharaonic power, which are a crook and a flail. The crook is a shepherd's instrument. Okay, It's a shepherd's instrument. It's used to gather the sheep. The flail is a whip. So the role of the pharaoh is simultaneously a peace, peaceful, um, nurturing, loving entity, as well as a stern um, being that can inflict force. He is the arbiter of both peace and war. And that's what we're getting here with the croak and the flail. All right. Now, a person was believed to, when they died, they had to go through their soul, their intellect, their intellect had to go through and pass through um, trials and tribulations, and they needed a magic spell book to help them get from point A to point B. So to help them travel through the underworld, they had this book, and it was called the Book of the Dead, and they were buried with it. And in it had the incantations, the spells, and the things that they would need, the passwords and the whatever, to get past the monsters and um, the other entities that were there safely. So they had to get through, they had to, had to pass through these trials before they got to the throne room of Osiris. And they were led there, sometimes by Anubis and sometimes by Horus. Okay? And they would find there the scales of justice. And their heart, a piece of their soul, would be placed on the scale. And it would be balanced against the feather of Maat. Okay? Against cosmic order. If the heart did not balance the feather, cosmic order, if you were found wanting, then what would happen is your um, heart would be thrown to this guy. This is Amet, the devourer. He's part hippo, part lion, part uh, crocodile. And he would devour your heart, and you would a piece of your soul would therefore cease to exist, and you would cease to exist. You wouldn't live any longer. Okay, you wouldn't go to hell. There was no hell. You just were gone. Which for the Egyptians was you were a state of unbeing. You you didn't exist. Anubis is the guy who places your heart and the feather on the scale. Thoth is the god of wisdom and writing, and he writes down the judgment. Now let's say, and it's always assumed that you passed. Okay, so then you are brought by Horus into the presence of Osiris and Nephthys and Isis and given your eternal reward and allowed to inherit and enjoy um, all the good things of life for all eternity. Okay, but again, you needed, to do that, you needed a body. You needed a container for your soul and that's where the mummies come in. Okay, so the mummies, you have to have that body maintained so that you have a place for your spirit parts to go it's a container for your spirit parts and if without that you don't have anything again it's a piece of the soul and without a piece of the soul intact you cease to exist so you have to have that mummy that's where the mummies come in now it's often it was known that Grave robbing was a thing because they would be buried with the riches of this life. So sometimes it was deemed acceptable that art would be able to take the place of the body. So if the body proper didn't survive, if the mummy didn't survive, then a likeness would be supplied to uh, house the soul in its place. Okay, again, I will link this down below, how to make a mummy and what that looks like. And this is uh, Dr. Nigel Spivy. He's explaining again. I'll link this down below how to how to the body is formed in Egyptian canon. Okay. Now, realism, naturalism, idealism, and photorealism. All right. 
we started talking about this um, at the beginning when we were just doing the the intro stuff. But this is realism, if you remember, is the uh, the 19th century French movement that depicts the poor. Okay, it humanizes the poor. That's what this is an example of realism. All right, naturalism is it's a picture that looks real, natural. Okay. Idealism is when you have the perfected forms. That these are superhuman forms. Okay. No one really looks like this. No one really looks like this. They're superhuman. Okay, those are the, this is idealism. Okay, and photorealism is when, this is a drawing, okay, when it looks like a photograph. I bring this up because the idea of idealism is going to be important. This uh, superhuman, these perfected bodies, okay, rather than showing to us how they really look, they're going to show, show us the perfect version thereof, okay? Also in Egypt, we're going to be getting some guardian figures. We're going to be getting this guy, which is a sphinx. Okay, the Greek sphinx is going to be a little bit different, but the Egyptian sphinx is uh, the human head and the lion body, sometimes wings, sometimes no wings. And the um, you're also beginning, going to be getting this thing. It's called a serpapard. It's a leopard ooh, with a snake neck, with this long neck. It's called a serpapard, serpent leopard, serpent bard, okay? And he's going to be showing up later on. Okay. Whew. Now, now we can start talking about all of our pieces, okay? So these are our pieces. Some of these are going to look familiar to you. Some of them are not. And that's okay, because we're going to talk about it. So before the dynasties of Egypt... Egypt's going to be split into Upper and Lower Egypt, two different kingdoms, okay? And you're saying to yourself, wait, Upper's down and Lower is up? Yes. And there's a reason for that, okay? Because they're going to, the Nile, unlike most rivers, the Nile um, heads north. And they're going to look at the headwaters at, of the Nile as up, we think of north as up. They're going to think of the headwaters of the Nile as up. Also, because their land, I'm going to use my phone as representing Egypt, but their land goes like this. Egypt is shaped like this if we take a cross section. So upper Egypt, the headwaters of the Nile are up here, and they're going to be up in the mountains. Okay, so down here, here you're going to have the mountains. And here's the Mediterranean Sea, okay? So it's going to go so up and down, upper and lower Egypt. Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense. Before the dynasties begin, we're going to have two separate kingdoms. We're going to have upper and lower Egypt, okay? And they're going to have two different crowns. And occasionally they're going to be depicted wearing two different crowns. The pharaohs are going to be depicted wearing two different crowns. you got the crown of lower Egypt, which is this red guy. These, again, this is from the side. So the face would be right here. The profile of the face would be right here. And this is the ear, a notch for your ear. So this is the crown of lower Egypt. This is the crown of upper Egypt. It looks like a bowling pin. And this is after the two kingdoms combine, they combine the two crowns. And so this is what it looks like. All right. So let's go to Egypt. And our first piece is pre-dynastic. So it's before the dynasties begin. And it's this is the palette of King Narmer. And it's called the palette of King Narmer because it depicts the king, Narmer, who unifies Upper and Lower Egypt. So he's coming from Upper Egypt, and he's conquering Lower Egypt. So he's coming from the headwaters of the Nile, and he goes north to the, to the Mediterranean and conquers and unifies all of Egypt. And that's what this is depicting. Okay, so here he is wearing the crown of Upper Egypt. He has in his right hand um, a mace, 
to smite his enemy. He's trampling enemies under his feet. We're getting Horus here in the in the papyrus reeds watching. And that's on one side. You're getting the goddess Hathor above watching the events. And on the flip side, on the reverse side, you're getting again here is Narmer. Now he's wearing the crown of Lower Egypt. You're getting people processing in front of him, and he's viewing the the conquests. Okay, here are the the defeated enemies. Their heads have been removed. They've been decapitated, and their heads are between their legs. All right. Now, in the middle here, in this middle register, see it's broken, they're broken into registers. In this middle register, you've got these serpent parts and these two figures trying to um, wrestle, control the serpent parts. Their necks intertwine, and is there in the middle is formed this um, shallow part. The palette of Narmer is about this big. Okay, it is a makeup palette where a person would mix makeup. Okay, now again, this was not for everyday makeup. This is ceremonial makeup, and it would be mixed right here in this little uh, hollow spot, this little shallow spot right here between the serpent parts, and that's where it was mixed. Now, the the Egyptians wore eye makeup. They would wear the uh, heavy eye shadow on on and below the eyes. And they would do that for the same reason that football players wear black on their cheekbones today for um, to protect against the sun so the light isn't bouncing off of your cheekbones into your eyes. Okay, So they would do the exact same thing for the exact same reasons. All right, so we've got a more breakdown, a more detailed breakdown of the, of the palette on both sides here. Okay and possible representations. Now we're not entirely sure what some of the things mean. Again, like the bull um, knocking down the walls of the city, probably the king, but we're not sure. All right. And again, some more detailed, highlighted, uh, so it's a little easier to see. Okay. Now again, we've got that perspective that twisted perspective that the Egyptians are famous for. We've got hierarchical scaling on both sides. We've got hierarchical scaling, okay? We've got it broken into registers. We've got the name of, or excuse me, the, the function of what it is. It's a makeup palette, a decorative makeup palette. And the context is that it is being used, or it was used to demark, to denote the unification of Egypt. Okay. So this was also a votive figure. Okay. And it was buried in a temple. So like the votive figures of Mesopotamia, we know that this um, was considered a, an offering. Okay. And put and buried in a temple like a like the votive figures okay now this introduces the Egyptian canon that'll last for 3,000 years the canon the word canon means the rules the rules for depicting Egyptian art okay so we're getting the hierarchical scaling we're getting the mixing of animals and humans we're getting the um, the twisted perspective okay all of these things are going to and the importance of conquest and showing the king as the bringer of order which is what he's doing he's he's destroying chaos and he's bringing order often the pharaoh is going to get depicted in in these heroic poses in these uh heroic ways even when he didn't necessarily do anything heroic because it helps maintain cosmic order that's his job as the pharaoh, as the king of Egypt, he's got to maintain order. He becomes Horus. 
right? He becomes Horus. He becomes the son of Isis and Osiris. And he merges with him, with Horus. And he, therefore, has to maintain cosmic balance. And if he doesn't, if he doesn't do his job, then the universe will break apart. Okay? So Egypt, Egyptian history is broken into um, three main parts. They're called kingdoms, three main organizational periods. We got Old Kingdom Egypt. We got pre-dynastic, and then we got Old Kingdom Egypt, which is the third, fourth, fifth dynasties. Then we've got an intermediary period. We've got a break. The Old Kingdom comes to an end. Then we've got the Middle Kingdom. Then we have another break. We've got some chaos. We've got some invaders happening. Then we've got um, a new kingdom. Then we've got another break. And then the late period. Okay? So we've got this first Old Kingdom. That This is the part that you're probably familiar with. This is the part where we're getting the pyramids. Okay? Now the pyramids are going to be based off of this form, which is called the mastaba. The mastaba is, it represents the first primordial land. The land that first, the point of creation, where the, the first land that rose out of the waters of chaos, okay, was, was the, it's called the ben-ben. The mastaba replicates the ben-ben. Alrighty. It replicates that ben, ben and it serves as the burial place, the a house for the for uh, the body. And you, you could walk in and place offerings within the mastaba. And the person would, here's like a temple chamber up here, place your offerings. But the person wouldn't be buried up there. They would be buried below in this chamber and would have a, um, a channel that would allow the ka, the spirit, to enter and reanimate the body. Okay. Now, when you take a mastaba and you stick it on top of a mastaba and you stick it on top of a mastaba and you stick it on top of a mastaba, you're going to get a pyramid. Okay. So, and this is where the idea of the pyramid comes from. It, they're just stacked up mastabas that have then been streamlined. Now, from this picture, and this is in Saqqara, the Steppe Pyramid of Zoser, um, Amenhotep, excuse me, uh, his name just evaporated from my head. The architect, his name just evaporated, uh, Imhotep, it's Imhotep, excuse me. Imhotep is going to be the architect who designs this for the pharaoh Zoser. Okay? Now, you can see that there's other buildings at the site Okay, because the pyramid wasn't just sitting by itself. It was uh, part of a temple, a whole temple complex. And we'll see that here in just a second. Okay, so there's the temple at Saqqara. So again, you've got that step pyramid, and here's the whole temple complex. You've got a whole lot of other things going on here. And that's true with all of the pyramids. So the piece that we're going to be looking at is, in fact, the Great Pyramids. Okay, at Giza, this is a little further north than Saqqara. We've got the Great Pyramid of, of Khufu, the Pyramid of, of Khafre, the Pyramid of Menkare, and Wives Pyramids. Okay, The Great Pyramid is the biggest. Now, it looks not the biggest, but it is. The Pyramid of, Men, of, of Khafre here is built on some higher ground so it looks bigger but it's not. Now the Great Pyramid, Great Pyramids collectively, they're known as the Great Pyramids. Um, here was the son, the, the main, the first one, his son, and then Khafre's son. So it was guy, son, grandson. Makes sense and then wives. And then again it was it was as a much bigger complex with temples and causeways and avenues. And I will link this video down below. And how did they make the pyramids? Again, I'm going to link this video down below. Okay? The pyramids were faced with stone. Okay? Most of that stone has been lost. If we look at the pyramid of Khafre, 
There we go. If we look at the Pyramid of Kafr, you can still see some of that limestone casing on the outside. Um, and you can see how up top it's been flattened. That's because, gosh, the pyramids had this, this casing stone that was on it, on all, all of them. So they, were, they didn't have this, and they, they didn't have this rough appearance. They were smooth like glass. And later writers tell us that they were smooth like, like a mirror. They were polished to a mirror finish, and they were white. And at the very top was a little pyramid of gold, which again represents that ben, ben that that primordial mound. And so if you can imagine what this looked like, these three imposing man-made mountains, these white gleaming uh, limestone with gold, capped in, in pure gold up at the top, and to, to catch the sunlight, to catch that light, and again, polished to a mirror finish, and what that, the spectacle of what that would be like. Um, otherworldly, okay? Now the Great Pyramid itself, okay, is made up of enough stone blocks, I think it's about two million stones, just in the Great Pyramid, that it's enough stone that if you dismantled the thing and laid them end to end, you could circle the nation of France. That's a lot of rock, <laughs> okay? Um, the casing stones have since been removed because it's an easy it's easier to take something from stone that's already exists rather than having to go quarry your own stone so it's easier just to do that and literally the only reason why the pyramids are still standing is because they couldn't be dismantled um they're too big <laughs> which is crazy now again to think about it in um perspective. Let's put this ancient Egyptian history into perspective. Cleopatra was the, you, you've heard of Cleopatra. She's the last queen of Egypt. She's closer to us, okay, in history. She's closer to us than she was to the building of the pyramids. That's crazy. That's how long Egyptian history is. Crazy, okay? So they were Again, not really meant to be entered. You can go inside of them. There is a place. There are, are passageways to get to the burial room, um, but they are not for visiting, okay? You're not supposed to go in there. Uh, you're supposed to go to the funerary temple that was attached to it, all right? The shape is going to be a reflection of that Benben, and it's the tomb for the king's Khufu, his son, Khafre, and Khafre's son, Menkare. Okay. And then again, it has that, that avenue, that street, that pathway that connects the temple complex to the pyramids and used in procession to carry the dead king. All right. The pyramids are oriented to the cardinal directions, and they are enormous. They're as the biggest. For most of human history, these have been the tallest buildings on the planet. It wasn't until the 1200s when we get a cathedral for the first time that's uh, bigger than the pyramid, that's taller than the pyramids. So part of the pyramids is the Sphinx, okay? Part of the pyramid complex is the Sphinx. And it's in line with Khafre's pyramid. And we believe, we think that it is a portrait of Khafre that it shows us his his face attached to a lion's body, okay? Um, you can see that he's in, sitting inside this hole. What they did was they, they channeled down, they dug down in the ground and kind of left this mound there, and then they sculpted the, the um, sphinx from that, all right? And then they used this rock that they quarried for the pyramids. He's a guardian figure that would have been there to protect the, uh, the bodies of the dead kings. I will link these videos, how they built the sphinxes down below. And again, it's a protective spirit. He's kind of like Lamassu, right? 
is carved in C2, which means on the site from, from the bedrock. Cats are going to be sacred in Egypt, we know that, and his face was, his nose was mutilated during the medieval period. Okay. We're going to have to take a pause and come back in a minute.